All right. Before we begin Kevin Raylick's lecture, everybody needs to understand that the topic that he's discussing, Mark Cards, is secretive. Usually you need to be in the magic world for those sorts of things to understand that kind of stuff. I know all the club members that are magicians right now are shaking their heads in agreement. So I need everyone right now to raise your right hand and take the oath. Raise your right hand. I'm, I'm, I can see you. Raise your right hand. Very good. Judy, raise your right hand. There we go. There we go. Okay. This is, I want you to repeat after me. I say your name. No, no. Say your name. Don't. I, Lee Asher. There we go. Promise that I will not use the information that Kevin Raylick teaches me today for any nefarious purposes. I swear I will use my powers for the greater good of mankind. Okay, you can raise your hand. You can lower your hand now. You've gotten that over with. All right. Let me introduce our first talk of the 2020 virtual convention. A magician by trade, Kevin Raylick plans to discuss and uh, get into the intricacies and the lineages of Mark Cards in the Americas. And you are not going to believe some of the uh, early manufacturers that are guilty of this. Okay. Don't worry, magicians. I can't stress this enough. Don't worry. Kevin will not be betraying anyone's confidences, okay? But he will be showing examples of mark cards from the past and the present. Please put a bunch of ones in that chat room right now. I want to see that chat room going crazy with ones. Ladies and gentlemen, your friend and mine, Kevin Raylick. Hi everyone, Kevin Raylick here, and I'm so excited to be joining everyone for this year's virtual convention. Of course, I wish that we could all be together in person, but I'm also really looking forward to the opportunities and features that a web-based convention provide. Today we're going to be talking about marked cards. This is an incredibly broad topic with a rich history, so we don't have time to talk about everything. But with my background as a magician, I'll be covering decks more from a magic perspective than a gambling perspective, and I'll also be focusing more on factory printed marked decks rather than self-marked decks. I'm hoping to give you a good starting point of some of the history, styles, and the notable figures that have brought us to the current decks on the market today. A little bit about me. I got into magic when I was eight years old, and I started collecting cards when I was a teenager. I've been a card producer for over 10 years. The first deck I produced was the Bicycle Lefty deck in 2009. Uh, for several years, I was the director of production for the Blue Crown and House of Playing Cards, where our most notable marked cards were the Knock series. I'm actually incredibly proud of the system we developed on the Signature series Knox, uh, where the design of the deck was simply a black borderline on a white canvas, yet each card was fully marked for suit and value. Since 2015, I've been the production manager of playing cards at Penguin Magic. Some of our marked decks include our version of Marked Maidenbacks, a uh, marked version of our Emperor deck designed by Mark Stutzman, and our Deland Centennial Edition decks. So, uh, that out of the way, let's talk about some overall marked card history. For many years, one of the earliest known printed references has been Liber de Ludo Allier, the book on games of chance by Girolamo Cardano. Cardano was an Italian polymath, scholar, and gambler who lived from 1501 to 1576. His text advised that cards could be marked on the edges or the backs. Uh, we also have references in Sharps and Flats, written by John Neville Maskelin in 1894, as well as Greater Magic, written in 1938 by John Northern Hilliard, that marking systems would have been developed shortly after the invention of playing cards themselves. The earliest marks were done with tactile methods, such as nail nicks, punches, dog ears, stains, smears, and so forth. Altering the color, shine, and or finish of cards were popular methods as well. Older visual marking methods typically involved adding or subtracting ink, systems like blockout work, scratch work, and so forth. Modern techniques can be as involved as requiring special infrared or UV inks, special lenses, camera systems, scanners, and so much more. Uh, 
Um, I want to give a big thanks to Steve Forty for providing me with some insight on a marked card reference even earlier than Cardano, a rare manuscript from 1478 by Luca Pacioli, Pacioli? <laughs> from Italy. Uh, that manuscript references asymmetries in cards, which are more commonly known today as one-ways. Uh, this reference was found and sent to Steve by Bill Kalouche, a fellow club member, and Steve published a note about this in his recent book, Gambling Sleight of Hand, 40 Years of Research, and that original manuscript is on display in the Vatican. Steve also told me about a reference from 1671, where there was a police report that was sent to the French Minister of Finance warning about asymmetrical backs based on the quality of the paper, and it states, we can equally forbid the card makers to use different types of paper in the same pack of cards because paper whiter or thinner can indicate to those in the know the difference between high and low cards of one color or another. We could oblige them to orientate the paper in the same direction instead of changing the direction and helping to distinguish cards orientated differently. So this reference basically describes the possibility of a factory marked deck back in 1671. Um, moving ahead in time, uh, the book Sucker's Progress, written in 1938 by Herbert Asbury, claims that the first cards that were marked in manufacturing were printed in New York around 1830, and that by 1835 they were quite prevalent. In the 1843 book, An Exposure of the Arts and Miseries of Gambling, Jonathan H. Green, who had himself been a gambler and a cheat, stated that in some cases, three-quarters of a print run of cards would be printed fair, and the remaining 25% would be marked. Uh, Sharps and Flats, as we mentioned earlier from 1894, does provide a partial image of a card and says that it was the first deck that was marked in manufacture, but unfortunately Masculine doesn't provide any additional details. Both Sharps and Flats, along with The Expert at the Card Table, which was written in 1902 by S.W. Erdnays, make an interesting note saying that self-marked decks are preferable over printed marked decks. And so this reflects sort of an interesting shift where we had a huge boom in printed or stamped decks during the 1830s and lasting a few decades, but then falling out of favor and becoming less common in the later part of the 19th century likely due to the rise of larger card manufacturers and new laws surrounding copyright and forgery. Um, for more information on the early history of marked cards, I would highly recommend Tom Ransom's really insightful article from a January 1990 issue of Clear the Decks, our very own publication here at the club. So now let's talk about some terminology. There have been several names given to marked cards over the years some of which have even changed meaning. In the grand expose of the science of gambling, which was written anonymously by an adept in 1860, we see the term marked cards used to refer to marks that are applied by hand versus the term stamped, uh, which referred to decks that were marked in manufacturing. A lot of other early sources refer to printed marked decks as stamped decks uh, because they were in fact stamped. The term paper may be the next oldest piece of slang. Um, this term is referenced in Sharps and Flats and several other early writings. Steve Forty has also informed me that this is the preferred term in the cheating world as well, paper. Uh, within the magic world, especially today, marked decks are generally referred to in one of two categories, either coded or reader. Coded refers to a deck that doesn't plainly show the suit and value, but rather needs to be decoded. And then Reader, at least in today's magic world, refers to decks that are openly readable, clearly marked with letters, numbers, suit pips. Um, what's interesting for me is that the Reader term historically had been used much more broadly than how magicians are using it today. Um, a majority of the gambling supply catalogs and blue books that I've seen from sort of the first half of the 20th century typically refer to their marked decks as readers, but the decks that they display as being offered are exclusively coded decks. We also have the term open marked deck, which came from Stephen Minch and Dennis Baer on their website Conjuring Credits. Um, I prefer a variation on this. Uh, I like to call a deck openly readable, simply to avoid confusion with the older and newer meanings of just plain readers.
If there is one name that I'd like you to remember from this presentation, it's Theodore Deland. Deland's work in magic and marked cards were really significant, and many of his methods and principles are still used today. Deland was from Philadelphia. He lived from 1873 to 1931. He worked for the U.S. Mint, though not as an engraver as a lot of people mistakenly believe. His first published use of marked cards was called The Devil's Own Trick, released in 1907. This was what's called in the magic world a packet trick. It's a trick that just uses a few cards rather than a full deck. And this particular trick used a few cards that were in a stacked order, and the markings provided the performer with information about the other cards in the deck rather than the card that you were looking at. And Deland went on to use those same sorts of principles in his full marked decks, the most famous example being the dollar deck. Now, the dollar deck is more commonly known as the automatic deck, or simply the Deland deck. Uh, the dollar deck was created in 1913. It is not only a marked deck, but it also comes in a special stack and is a stripper deck, which is a tapered deck. Uh, the marks use a clock style system. And while Deland didn't necessarily invent the clock system, he absolutely popularized it. Uh, there are references to dial-based systems in older publications, including in Sharps and Flats, uh, where marks that are sequentially ordered around an object and as radials um, are mentioned. Uh, the dollar deck itself has over 230 marks per card. <laughs> 230 marks per card. Um, I still find that unbelievable, even though this is a fact that I've known for quite some time. Uh, and those various marks tell you not just the identity of the card you're looking at, but the positions of all the other cards in the deck as well, even when the deck has been cut. So no matter how many times you cut the deck, you can locate cards within that deck thanks to all the marks. And so with that many marks per card, that's over 12,000 marks in all in the entire deck. Uh, Deland created several other decks, including the Daisy, Nifty, League, and Starback, and all of those can be seen in Hockman in the Novelty section, numbers N2 through N6. Um, one of Deland's lesser-known decks is the Wonder deck, which is an edge-marked deck. Edge-marked decks aren't actually marked on the edge, um, you know, on the cut edge, but they're, they're marked so close to the edge of the card that you can view the marks from looking at the edge of the deck, especially if it's beveled, you know, kind of angled a little bit. Uh, as for the Wonder deck, there are only six known originals still in existence, so I don't personally expect to be able to ever add one of those to my collection, unfortunately. Uh, the wonderful thing, though, is that Richard Kaufman reprinted several of Deland's decks alongside his epic book, Deland, Mystery, and Madness. And if you would like to learn more about Deland, I can't recommend this book more highly. It's fantastic. Um, it's something that Richard took, I believe, around 20 years to research and write, and it is amazing. Um, and when he put the, uh, uh, the book out, Richard also created reprints of the Dollar Deck and the Wonder Deck, plus several of Deland's single card or packet trick, um, tricky cards. Uh, Richard also printed Deland's automatic trick cards, which are not to be confused with the automatic deck. And this was for the first time ever. It was a deck that Deland had designed, but that had never been printed before Richard uh, put it out for us to enjoy. Um, and then at Penguin Magic, we very recently created a revised and reprinted version of both the Daisy and Nifty decks as a Centennial Edition. They were originally printed in 1919, so in 2019 we offered our recreations with a few changes and adjustments to be more suitable for modern performers. Uh, for example, we changed the color of the Daisy deck to sort of a burgundy as opposed to its original blue back so that we could make a red and blue set. Uh, with the Daisy and Nifty, each of those has over 500 marks per deck. So it was quite a challenge to really ensure that all the marks were correct, so I can only imagine how difficult it was for Deland to create the dollar deck with over 12,000 marks, um, especially given, you know, he didn't have the digital technology that we enjoy today. Um, there are still decks being offered today that use a clock-based marking system. Far, far too many to list. But a couple of recent examples, um, both of which were designed by the club's own Randy Butterfield, include the Bicycle Inspire deck, 
uh, which was produced by Alex Pandrea at the Blue Crown, and the Parisian deck, which Randy self-produced. Now, there are also a number of decks that use a combination of marks plus a stack, just like the land did, to provide users with tons of information. And some of those decks include The Code, produced by Andy Nyman and Theory11, The Marksman deck by Luke Germay and Vanishing Inc., The Sum deck, or Setup Mark deck, by Roy Johnson, and The Gambler's Mark deck by Houdini's Magic. And all of those versions are offered either on Rider, Maiden, Mandolin, or Phoenix backs, uh, which makes them look a little less suspect to modern audiences compared to a design like the Dollar deck. And lastly, in recent years, there has been a huge resurgence in edge-marked decks, sort of like what we see in the Wonder deck. Now, while Delane didn't invent the concept of edge-marking, he certainly made it more known within the magic world. Um, and one of the big things that I give credit to in the upsurge in edge-marked decks are the gorgeous butterfly decks from Andre Shanichka. Um, they seem to have inspired a lot of other creators to develop their own edge-marked decks. I really like to think that Deland would have been really pleased to know that his work has had such a lasting impact on the world of cards and magic. So we talked earlier about magicians dividing marked cards into the coded and reader categories. Well, Al Baker, who lived from 1874 to 1951, developed one of the earliest examples of openly readable marked decks. Baker was from New York, and he served as the Dean of the Society of American Magicians from 1941 to 1951. His system was called the Baker Readers, and it was published in his book Pet Secrets in 1951. Uh, and Baker's system used scratch work, where you use a pin or needle to scratch away the ink on the card to make a white mark. Now, Baker found a particular feature in the design of angelback squeezers that allowed him to turn a simple curl into a desired letter or number. But even more important than the system itself is Baker's philosophy on performing. He noted how vital it is for a magician to be able to read marks extremely quickly for a deceptive performance, and that larger marks help to facilitate that. Uh, so, compared to the older coded systems that were used by gamblers, a large, openly readable system like Baker's, and the many others that have come after it, uh, they're far more useful to magicians. You can particularly see that in the DMC Elite. Uh, it's an excellent mark deck designed by Phil Smith, where the marks are about 10 millimeters tall. Uh, that's about a 40-point font size. Um, Phil really has a keen understanding of the balance of visibility and camouflage in a mark deck, so Phil's system really allows modern performers to implement Baker's philosophies in a great way. If anyone out there is a budding mark deck creator and you're thinking of using an openly readable mark, my advice is to go big or go home. There have been some decks in recent years that do technically use an openly readable system, but the marks are literally one millimeter or smaller, which is equivalent to about a four-point font, uh, which makes them next to useless as a workable mark deck in my opinion. But anyway, back to Al Baker. It is my belief that the Baker readers are a big reason that magicians refer to the openly readable mark decks as readers, rather than the older usage where the reader term was given to any and all marked decks. I also believe that the GT Speed Readers by Garrett Thomas also contributed to that shift in terminology. Um, a few years ago, Bill Kalush, and big thanks uh, to him for letting me include this reference, he implemented the same swirl from the Angelback Squeezer design into his Ask Alexander deck. So that allows you to use the Baker Marking System on uh, that particular deck from Conjuring Arts. Now, the Al Baker system is often credited as being the first openly readable marked deck, and it's certainly a strong example, but I have found a reference that goes back a little further. Fred Browey, in his column Out of the Past, from the November 1946 issue of Who Guards Magic Monthly, mentions the idea of using a typewriter to type the suit and value of a card onto a blueback deck. And now Browie credits this idea to T. Page Wright. Wright was a magician who unfortunately died quite young in 1930 at the age of 25, so his concept of the typewriter almost certainly originated in the 1920s. 
Now, Baker doesn't mention in Pet Secrets when he developed his system for the angel back squeezers. However, that back design was created by New York Consolidated in the late 1800s, so I would say it's entirely possible that Baker's system could predate the T-Page Wright typewriter idea, even though it was published later. Moving into the later part of the 20th century, we have Ted Leslie, who was a German magician and mentalist who lived from 1937 to 2008. He's very well known in the magic world, and in my eyes really ignited the modern magician's love and usage of Mark Dex. Um, Leslie published his Working Performer's Mark Deck Manual in 1983, and he popularized the use of rub-on transfers as card marks. And so these transfers are basically ultra-thin decals that it can be burnished or rubbed onto a surface. Uh, Leslie applied marks for both suit and value, and he used rider back decks. Uh, his system became pretty widely used by magicians, it was really popular. And I would say that the majority of openly readable factory printed mark decks today more or less stem from Ted Leslie's work, whether the current creators realize that or not. Uh, and you can still get the Leslie transfers, they're available through library.com if you'd like to try your hand at marking a full deck with that technique. I would highly suggest you give it a shot. Now, a particularly notable magician whose work followed Leslie's is Boris Wilde. Boris is an award-winning French magician who has extensively used marked cards in his work. Boris has his own system, it's called the Boris Wilde Marked Deck. And while his original deck used the transfers like the Ted Leslie system, Boris's system is really different in a lot of ways. Uh, so first and foremost, Boris applies the marks only for value, and he uses the placement of the mark to indicate the suit. Also, unlike Leslie's system, which marked the deck near the middle, Talk about that you're the if just I generally from by has toxic companies are producing mark decks for magicians all the time uh, there's also been an uptick recently on kickstarter in seeing collectible decks being marked even though they're not always targeted specifically at magicians so i enjoy that i love seeing all the new mark decks coming out um, Jackson Robinson, who's going to be, I'm sure, well known to everybody watching, offered his first ever Mark deck this year, the 2020 deck. It's a really fun, openly readable Mark deck. And actually, Jackson technically released two Mark decks this year, if we count his 1982 VHS deck. Uh, because that VHS deck has an animated back design, you can see that when you riffle the deck like a flipbook, it is technically a marked deck, uh, although it would be admittedly difficult to identify an individual card um, <laughs> by all the different sort of animation slides. Uh, so now, over the years, there have also been many marked decks that have been offered to the general public. A lot of those are coded decks that are included in Magic Kits for Kids, and in a way, I think it's actually kind of nice that the public are exposed to some of those more difficult to read decks, because I think it makes them believe that all marked decks are hard to read and need to be decoded, uh, which I think generally is good news <laughs> for magicians. Um, very recently, in 2019, a company called Curiosity Box, which primarily makes educational items and science-based gadgets and toys, uh, they released a marked bicycle deck called Inks Playing Cards, and that uses a clock style system. It's heavily based on Delam's dollar deck. Another really great example is the David Blaine mind reading deck, 
which was released in retail stores in 2010. These are a really terrific Mark deck. They're easy to read, and they're on the beautiful Split Spades back design by Mark Stutzman, which is one of my favorite back designs of all time. So that one is a definite favorite for me. Um, and another really notable one, uh, Nintendo, who we all, of course, know for video games, was originally a manufacturer of playing cards when they were founded in 1889. Now, in 2006, they produced a game for the Nintendo DS called Master of Illusion, and the game included a bridge size Mark deck, and it's an openly readable system. Now, I don't personally own a Nintendo DS, so I'm not sure how the game itself is. The deck is nice. Uh, but if anyone has played that Master of Illusion game, please let me know if I should buy a DS just to play that one game. Uh, I also want to encourage you to please feel free to contact me about anything from this talk or anything regarding marked cards in general. We've really only scratched the surface today. This is something that I could talk about for hours on end, so please don't be shy. Uh, my email is kevinraylick at gmail.com. That's kevin, R-E-Y-L-E-K, at gmail.com. And you can also find me on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, at kraylick. And you can also follow the latest from the Penguin Card Department, by following at Penguin Cards. Uh, so I would definitely love to hear about any decks or references you found or uh, yeah, answer any questions for you. I would also like to recommend the book Marked for Life by Kirk Charles. This was the first book I ever got that provided in-depth information about the history and usage of marked cards. There's an alternate version of the book called Hidden in Plain Sight. Now that version was released alongside the Boris Wilde deck in 2005 and has an additional chapter about Boris's deck. So you can get either or, the one with more content is hidden in plain sight. Um, but one of the most valuable elements of either version is the extensive bibliography. So that's why I would highly recommend checking out whichever one you can find. And lastly, I hope that you'll all tune in for the deck debut event tomorrow, because I may just be presenting a new deck from Penguin Magic that ties in with this very subject, and I am really excited to share that with everyone. So, thanks so much, enjoy the rest of the convention, I'm really excited to see the, the other speakers, so uh, yeah, hope to hear from you, hope to see you all next year, and uh, have a good one.